Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hi, Jono. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's episode uh, 116. I can't. Uh, I'll chapter talk. 15. It's chapter oh, yeah. 15 it's of Ambitious Card. You know, I've been putting together the calendar for, for season two, and you're going to be so happy I'm already- because episode one is chapter one. Episode two is chapter two. The whole bullet catch thing until the end of, uh, until the, end of the book, we're going to get a little dicey. But up until then, it's going to be real simple for you. Math wise. Yeah, math wise. Yeah, I can't. Yeah speak to the rest of it but you're going to be it that part's going to be simple anyway we're we're in episode 16 of season one we have chapter 15 of the ambitious card and we also have a a dual interview with two local boys who made good in the magic world yeah both of them are a delight we had the luxury the gift the great good fortune to have them both appear here in minneapolis during uh sunday night magic and it is always a treat to see them perform. Um, Nick was new to me when I first saw him perform at Sunday Night Magic, and I instantly uh, fell in love with him and his style. But Derek and I have known each other for a lot of years, and um, he is the consummate professional and hilariously funny. And not only that, his magic will absolutely rock your world. Yeah. And it's, he does it so casually that yeah. you, it takes you a second to realize just, you know, yes, the comedy's fantastic, but the magic is also fantastic too. He's just doing it so smoothly. You know, I first saw him, I think he was still a teenager or just out of being a teenager in a fringe show he did, which was an adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I think it was a one man thing that he did that had a, an effect at the end. There was some video stuff involved where he made the audience disappear. Uh, And then I was lucky enough to almost do a play with him. The play didn't happen, but he did some readings of it. uh, And he was charming and funny. You know, I, when people ask for a description of, uh, well, what is Eli Marks? What, what, what what is that? And I I always say, if they know him, I'll just say, well, picture uh, it's, it's like murder. She wrote, but Angela Lansbury is played by Derek Hughes. And that really pretty much covers it. If you just picture Derek Hughes in the role of Eli Marks, you're kind of done. There it Uh, is. But I also, like you, had never heard or seen Nick DeFott. I believe when he did Sunday Night Magic with our friend Suzanne, he had just appeared on the cover of Genie Magazine. Yeah. And I, you know, the front door was locked at the theater and I uh, I saw a car drive up and that must be him. And it was, he was in town and his mom was dropping him off. And he has a young look to him anyway, so it, it just looks so adorable. Uh, he got out of the car with his bag of stuff and then came in and just blew us away. He was yeah. so much fun and, and wise beyond his years when it comes to comedy and magic. Absolutely. Old soul in that little young body of his, but he's absolute delight on stage and off stage. Uh, anytime I've had any contact with him, whether it's uh, watching him, whether it's chatting with him, whether it's interviewing him like this, or just kind of back and forth on Facebook, he has been an absolute hoot to interact with. Well, let's let's just cut to the chase then and let everyone in on our our interview. The idea was, you know, these guys can really talk about anything. Uh, but for today's episode, we wanted to explore the ins and outs of comedy magic. Do you guys, do you guys, when you think about yourselves, do you think of yourselves as comedians? Because when we were talking, there was a lot of this comedian, that comedian, uh, as we were kind of getting set for this uh, interview. Do you think of yourselves as comedians or as magicians? Or is there, how do you view yourselves? Derek? (laughs) Well, I I will say there's, it's, there's a conscious hybrid, you know, like I, I know that they're separate skill sets. So I have worked uh, and focused at different times on that piece of the pie. You know, there's been times when I've, I've booked myself in a feature spot you know, for a year uh, opening for headline comics, doing no magic, just working on character voice, point of view and and creating a uh, build up to a crescendo, making a show happen with just words, which is what the stand up does. Sure. And and then folding that back into my work as a magician. I don't I don't ever book myself straight stand up right now because magic is a big part of my brand, my voice and what I enjoy. But 
I, I do feel like I'm both. Nick, what about you? Uh, I'd like to think that I flex both muscles. I've never worked solely as a comedian. I've done open mics and tried it, like to, gone out and done seven minutes here, seven minutes there, a spot in a friend show where maybe I close with a magic trick, but just do stand up to open and, and try to learn how to feel naked like that. Cause I started out doing magic. So I didn't, you know, I felt like a trombone player without the instrument, you know, it's weird <laughs> not having something in your hands, but yeah, actively trying to flex both muscles. And in the show, I think when I write stuff, I write probably comedy first or entertainment first, at least entertainment centric. So, you know, sometimes things come more from a gag, like the, I do a ring routine where a ring ends up on my foot that came from a prank out of high school that I wanted to tell the joke story of on stage. And then the trick kind of developed out of it. So hopefully a mix of both. Do you consciously work on the balance between the comedy and the magic? Are you con consciously free thinking I'm going too far this way, I'm going too far that way? Uh, I've had routines where, I, <laughs> where magician friends or entertainment friends afterwards come up and go, wow, that was, you know, that's a lot of buildup for a 30 second trick or, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think over time you learn to kind of feel out that balance with an audience. There are certain things that are, you know, like I do this spoons thing in the show where it's, uh, it's, it's a total nothing old juggling trick. So I, and it's more joke centric than it would be magic or even effect or even stunt based, I guess, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I'm gonna pipe in on that a little bit, yeah. Nick. Though, because with that spoon gag, it's 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 uh, it's a runner in the show, mm -hmm. so it's something that uh, it gives the audience a through line, and right. it's a it's it creates great drama for you because it is your it's your goal. You know, it's like right. if you if what is this guy fighting for? And here's this thing that he's failed. He fails again, right. um, and it's a build up to. Uh, final Didn't, triumph, but right. <laughs> right, it's a but total it's, nothing thing. But it's about but the you journey make it, for sure. Yeah, and and it gives you this, uh, you know, like what is an act but a but a little play, and you're the protagonist. Sure. And it gives you something that you're fighting for. You know, mm -hmm. it's the MacGuffin. It's the the missing bike in the Pee Wee's Big Adventure, which is a horrible analogy because it's the spoons and cups trick. But you know, it it's that kind of thing and, and and every time i had structured a show before i started using that it was just here's a bunch of tricks but now it's here's a bunch of tricks leading to you know under this umbrella feel if that makes sense at all mm -hmm. yeah it gives yeah. you a hope and a dream and that gives you something to then act off of to have hope and defeat which is then hilarious in theory <laughs> <laughs> You've seen night. it both ways, yeah. <laughs> how, how about you, Derek? What do you, how do you get that balance between the funny and the magical? You know, I, I had a similar experience. Both uh, Nick and I have the wonderful opportunity to have Matt King as a mentor, and Matt King is, you know, an incredible comedy magician. And uh, we both have had the honor of filling his shoes when he takes a break in his room at Harrah's. Mm -hmm. And early in uh, that opportunity for me, some friends came. Uh, my buddy Derek Delgadio and Rob Zabrecki were in Vegas at the same time and they came by. And at that time, my hour long set, I was touring a lot of colleges. So I'd open with a quick magic trick and then I'd go into about eight minutes of a stand up routine that related to I did America's Got Talent. It related to my attitudes towards reality television and it had some tags and, and then I'd get back into the flow of magic. Um, and afterwards, their main note was like, everybody came here for a magic show. Um, and they, they, were, they weren't expecting you as well. <laughs> so flip that around. Do 15 minutes of strong magic. And then you earn the respect and the trust of the audience to get a little autobiographical and, and kind of go down a thought process. And I thought that was a brilliant note. Sure. Um but yeah, trying to find that balance. I'll tell you, magic and comedy, I feel have, they're very similar. Like a good trick and a good joke, both have a setup and a climax, right? And both in their best, the climax is both surprising yet inevitable. Like a good punchline, of course that's the punchline and you didn't see it coming. Same with a good trick. Like 
that punched me in the face. So there's parallels. And I found that I, I had a bunch of, in my straight standup, I had standup material that had setup, punch, tag, tag, tag. And then I had jokes that were one-liners. And it, all of my magic was like multi-phase magic routines. So a handful of years ago, I started consciously engineering one-liner magic moments to, to texture and give like, you know, vary the rhythm of the show to, you know, keep the audience hopefully from falling asleep. So that was something I borrowed from comedy and applied to my work in magic that I have found to be very, very effective. You mentioned Mac as a mentor. Looking back, um, you're both from the Twin Cities. You might end up saying some of the same names, but who did you look up to? Who are your inspirations uh, when you were just getting started in both the magic? Bill Arnold. And- Mike Madden, uh, Jerry Johnson, Jeff Williams for me, Fred Bache. I saw Fred Bache at a school. It was the best thing ever. I mean, it, for me, I guess comedy magic wise, for sure, seeing Jerry Johnson at the banquets and at IBM stuff, just be doing some of the most, you know, tightly scripted comedy magic I'd ever seen was big and prop comedy. <laughs> and Jerry Johnson, who, who I'm going to say, I can I can see the influence because he's pretty deadpan. Like, yeah, he's not a he's not a whack a wackadoodle. For sure, he's like your grandpa, you know. And so I and I can see that in you. You're like a grandpa on stage. Yeah, <laughs> you're the youngest grandpa in the yeah, <laughs> for sure. I think because you know initially when you hear about comedy magic, you think of big goofy and yo for my opener and pulling out the three foot opener and doing all this stuff but jerry was very dry and it was and seeing video of joel hodgson too i had seen like bootleg vhs tapes of joel doing something and i was like wait you can talk to an audience like that you can like you can you can leave space in a sentence and and make the room feel you know something other than just joke 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 uh so that was big and uh, VHS tapes of Tom Mollica was huge. Obviously not local, but burned out <laughs> copies of the Stevens tape and Showtime at the Tomfoolery. Okay, hey, I'm going to pipe in too, and uh, just in answering that question uh, in a little bit more detail. You know, Bill Arnold was the house MC what, at what is now Acme Comedy Club. But Nick, man, you missed it, and I and I feel for you because when I was 14, 15, 16 years old, Acme Comedy Club was called the Rib Tickler. And a man named David Woods called Mike Lacey at the Comedy and Magic Club in Hermosa Beach and said, Mike, do you mind if I make your club in Minneapolis? Wow. And he said, fine. And he, I mean, it was the template, the posters, opening every show with New York, New York. And every week there was a headline comic and a headline standup. I mean, sorry, a headline magician, magician. and a headline standup working the same that same little stage. And I begged my mom and she snuck me in every <laughs> chance I got. So I saw... John Carney with Jake Johansson. I saw Scott Servine. Wow. Uh, you know, I saw amazing stand-up and amazing comedy, and the, clearly that that sunk in. And Bill Arnold was the house MC. That's the best thing ever. <laughs> so I'm 14, 15, 16. I'm watching Bill Arnold do his MC spots. You know, uh, which all that material became his unstoppable. 30 minute corporate set, you know, like, I mean, just laugh your ass off. So he took that act and integrated into that long running play, Triple Espresso with Bob Stromberg and Michael Pierce Donnelly. And I had the opportunity to audition uh, to play his role because there was more than one production happening. And they asked me, uh, you can either do your material in the, there's a short spot where you do a magic act. And they said, you can do a comedy magic set and I had a pretty decent act at that time. Or you can do Bill's set that he does in the show. Scott Servine did his own stuff, right? I said, I'll do Bill's set. Yeah. <laughs> because I was then paid close to union wages to put on the skin of my hero and say his words and do his actions, completely rip him off and feel how that worked from the inside out. And it was, it was a masterclass in stillness and silence and uh and rhythm it was it was wow. a thrill <laughs> all right so but let me ask you this question do you think that people can be taught to be funny or is it something that you are sort of inherently born with and you can refine it like you guys have done or or could you take somebody off the street and 
and walk him through this and say, this is how you do it. And here's how a punchline. Well, could you teach somebody to be funny or is it? No, that can't be done. I, I think, yes, I think you can learn. I think a non, a non-professional, someone who would say, I'm not a funny person could learn some things, some rules, you know, the rule of three, you know, how to, to, to establish a rhythm and break it. That's going to inherently, you know, that there's math there to an audience going, ha ha action to stillness can create comedy. There's, there's certain rules. I was always funny. Like I was always a f- humor has always been a part of my point of view. You know, I, I think about, I had heart surgery when I was 10 and in the ER I'm in pain. I'm on drugs. I'm 10. My mom's bummed. She brought me a GI Joe doll and I see my mom is bummed. I run the doll across my chest and I go, look, it's a battlefield. <laughs> and it, and she and it gets a laugh and 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 I think there's a almost a danger in that and I don't know how you feel about this Nick but I having been sort of naturally funny I don't spend enough time thinking about the rule of three and where I can apply it to my act and some of the more technical elements you know because I've been able to rely on yeah, I'll pull it out you know I'll I'll pull it off it'll be good enough. Mm-hmm. And sure. talent can be a, a limitation. You yeah, know? absolutely. If, if, some, if someone wants to be funny, they could learn to be funny and be funnier than me because they, if they worked harder. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think with whatever we want to call it, like natural talents, or if that's your personality, there is the danger of falling into being comfortable with that, especially when you're writing. And I know that I've done it with certain things, but it's tough because I can go like usually before I put something on stage, I'd say I script it 70 to 80%. Like I have all the big landmarks and the big beats kind of mapped out. And then I go, ah, the other 20, 30% is going to be stuff that's born through doing it in front of real people and interactions with people. Cause a lot of that 20% is going to be stuff that I can't practice. It's having my leg over the guy cutting my sock off or, or do it, you know, conflict resolution with the guy doing the spoons routine where lines come out of being in that situation that I couldn't, you know, I could manufacture it if I was writing it like a screenplay, I guess, but you want something that feels natural. And so that 20% is built in the moment. But I, yeah, I think somebody technically could <laughs> sit down and write something that's a, a lot cleaner than the thing that I'm comfortable kind of putting on stage. <laughs> Fascinating. Is there something you, since you both worked with Matt King <clears throat> and been able to observe him so much, is there any one thing that you've each taken away from, from his performance style and his ability? I'll say there's something I'm envious of, which is his strong point of view. Like you walk in, that audience sees this guy, you know, in that in that plaid suit with this kind of local yokel cadence. And slowly but surely you come to realize he's the smartest guy in the room. But he never tips his hat to that. You know, I, to this day, struggle with what is my point of view? You know, like I'll, I'll be candid with you, you know, my friends and fellow artists here. I don't know if I could write on paper what my persona is. And I've had many people over over time come to me and go, man, your persona is so strong. Your state, you, your character is so defined. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I wish, I wish, you know, having a conversation with Louis Anderson years ago about this very thing and struggling, like, what's my point of view? And he's like, I'm, and I said, I turned it on him and I'm like, well, what's your what what's your log line? What's your point of view? And he's like, well, <laughs> honestly, I couldn't tell you, but he said this and I thought it was really great. He's like, I don't tell any jokes that don't fit it. Oh, like he sure. knows he writes yeah. jokes that aren't right for him, but he knows he'll never do those jokes. He has an innate understanding of what his persona is, even if he couldn't say it in one line. Matt King did tell mm-hmm. me in one line and he told me to keep it keep it secret and i was i was blown away you know like kind of a a strainer a litmus through which to run ideas and does this fit this definition you know Mm -hmm. it's almost a brand thing right it is a brand thing once you know Mm -hmm. your brand then it's easy to hold stuff up to your brand and say can i do that that does that fit my brand no it doesn't fit my brand i can't do it as much as i want to do it because it creates that sort of dissonance with an audience and it becomes almost effortless 
in theory, to write material for your brand when it is a clear brand. My buddy, mm -hmm. Rob Zabrecki, one of my best friends, has a very clear brand. Imagine Pee Wee Herman meets the Adams family. That's it. And mm -hmm. I can write material for Rob till the cows come home. And I, I dream of the day that writing for myself is as effortless, where I have the, <laughs> you know, sometimes in creativity, limitations free you. You yeah. know, when you have a, a parameter through which to push ideas, then they can come more f because you can more quickly eliminate the fat, I guess. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Like, I find it way easier, even if somebody doesn't have as defined a character, I find it way easier to write for other people because I at least kind of know, I know where the, the fence is around what they would do and what they wouldn't. It's it's a lot easier. It's like taking the way Tyler Erickson, another Minneapolis guy would put it is, it's very easy to take the Fonz and put him in the woods and know how that would play out. You know, it's easy to write those episodes when you you know that this defined person that would do this kind of thing or this city guy and you put him in the woods and that's how he's gonna act, you know? And and yeah, I think it's, it's a thousand times easier to, to do that than write for yourself, especially when you know, I think I'm constantly self-editing and self-doubting when I'm writing for for me on stage with one guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, cool you know, thing. we always, we self-edit too much and we're writing for ourselves, especially up front. This is interesting. You know, this kind of goes into, uh, there was an exercise and I never fully did it, but uh, Rudy talked about this in lecturing, Rudy Kobe, uh, who was actually another big influence. If, if you were to say outside of Minneapolis, when I was emerging, the, who the influences were, and I'd say Penn and Teller, Harry Anderson, Rudy Kobe, like very unique voices in magic. I saw people that were doing magic in a very unique way. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's what I want. I want a, I want a, a path outside of the, uh, the standard tropes. But the idea is like uh, Lance Burton, uh, Dracula, and um, Elvis. Holy crap, that's Lance Burton. Yeah. And that's what Lance, that was Lance's choice. I wanted to be Dracula and Elvis. And I've never taken like, uh, done that exercise fully myself where I've embraced some elements of personas that I would like to present and then acted in that way. But I think it's a powerful tool for anybody who would be interested in you know, trying to further their own persona. Playing that, have, Nick, have you defined yourself that way? Not really. I never have. And it, it's funny to me because like I've talked to, to Mac about the Lance thing. He actively, you know, he put that on himself. So it was like he molded, you know, he literally wanted to be this specific Dracula. And so that first appearance on Johnny Carson is him pretending to be that version of dracula doing this you know it's is, is it it's the frank striking. langella version exactly yeah okay yeah you can see uh, that yeah it's stunning <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it's funny when you because i think people who are just themselves like it'd be hard to go uh mac is this and this or joel hodgson is this and this or top yeah i mean and I think it's hard also to see it clearly from the inside. I've asked friends. I had Jason sure. Sudeikis tell me that uh, rude gentleman for me. And I was sure. like, I see that. You know, mm -hmm. I often wear a three-piece suit. I'm kind and warm, but I'm snarky. And I was like, that's interesting. I mean, I think for me, it's funny because I can, I can pinpoint where I, I had a big realization when I was probably 16 or 17 when I had a friend come up to me after a show and go, he goes, you're, you're way funnier at the house just sitting around than you are on stage. And I like developed a complex from that one sentence, but it, it, you know, I realized that the way that I act around my friends, I'm very pokey with people that I'm close to where it's a more abrasive sense of humor. And so it became this active decision of by the end of the show, I want this guy that's up on stage for 25 minutes to, I want to be that with him. So in order to do that for the first 40 minutes of the show, we're building a trust and building a friendship with the audience so that at the end, they know that that's out of love and that that's out of this genuine relationship that I've built with them, that I can say these things and do these things and get away with them. Uh, it's a lot different if I'm doing 15 minutes and just jump right into that stuff. It's, you know, we, you don't get all the, I mean, literally the first 20 minutes is self-deprecating jokes just to, so that they know that that's where we're at, yeah. <laughs> that, that it's not all the guy at the end of the show being pokey with the guy. Uh, so let me, let me ask this question. We've talked a lot about 
is sort of the magic part of it and the comedy part of it. The magic that you two do, the magic that Mac King does is phenomenal. The magic itself is phenomenal. So how does the comedy serve the, your ability to, to, does it disarm me as an audience member so that when you then do the sort of the magic, it's even more impactful than if there was no comedy? You know what I'm, is that, I, I guess that's kind mm -hmm. of a... I do. I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, I'll tell you, as for me personally, a very, very high caliber of, of magic has always been, you know, the aim. I don't want to do stuff that people maybe have seen in other shows. Uh, and I don't want to do gags. Like Amazing Jonathan is hilarious, a genius. He doesn't fool anybody. Like you don't leave that show really. I don't know. I can't think of a single effect that he does where you're like, whoa, what just that's happened? a moment of wonder. Right. He's more sort of poking fun at the tropes of being a magician and and using that for great, great character development comic effect. I do want to blow people's minds. So there was a great lesson I used to do. There's a trick where uh, someone imagines turning a card upside down in a deck of cards, and then I spread through the deck of cards, and one card is reversed, and it is the card that they were just thinking of. And it's uh, it's a beloved secret among magicians and a tried and true friend as an effect and it's a mind blower if you don't know what's going on and i used to do this i used to hold the deck of cards and say at the end of the build-up i'd say and jim what card did you turn over in your imagination and you'd say the three of clubs the four of diamonds <laughs> and i got a great laugh and then i'd pull them out and i'd spread through and no it was the the, the three of clubs and that was just strong but juan tamarez who's a master magician from spain and is very funny he gave a lecture once and it it was like oh man i gotta i gotta kill that joke that dumb joke that gets a laugh every time but it takes away from the blow your mind wonder of that that impossible mystery his rule is comedy 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 and then as you approach the climax of the effect the comedy diminishes, diminishes until there's no comedy leading up to the wonder. And then Eugene Berger, a great mentor of mine from Chicago, he would he encouraged me to not then go at the end, ooh, lucky that happened, and get a laugh right after the reveal. He taught me to let it linger and let the astonishment sink in and not get uncomfortable with the audience going, what? Because the comic wants to make it make us all comfortable again because being blown away is not comfortable right it shakes your paradigm it changes your life for a moment oh oh my god my beliefs may not be my, may not be true <laughs> the world isn't flat yeah. you know and anyways a, a limiting make making sure they don't blur each other out is really important yeah i think for sure in my you know growth that has been one of my biggest weaknesses and something that i've act actively noticed is especially when putting in new material where you don't really know all the beats of the trick yet so like if you've got a heavier prediction type thing where the ending is really strong and let's say up to this point i've done three or four gags where the tricks weren't quite you know the most striking mentalism effects or whatever when we get to a real one, they didn't know how to react. And so it's like, I, I kind of had to learn how to, you can layer on the comedy for up to a certain point, And then there is this cutoff or like you were saying, I guess you, you can taper it off <laughs> a little less abruptly than I probably do. Then, you know, hit the beats you need to do in the trick. And then you can't immediately step all over your own dong going back into hitting them with jokes because audiences do just need to sit in certain things. And like I would do, I would put a new, I put a book test in the show one time and did it for two, three weeks. And I just go, this is not going well, not realizing that, the, the like awkward silence and kind of this this feeling that I hadn't felt before was the exact intended outcome. I just didn't know what that feeling was because I was used to just going and knowing the beats of jokes and knowing this and this and this hits in the music and you know, and so to 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 kind of have 
the second I guess I, I started putting good magic at the show, <laughs> I had to I had to kind of relearn certain beats and relearn how to how to present that kind of stuff for sure. I went through that exact same experience with uh, the book test I wrote, yep. <laughs> and I worked. I sessioned with Max Maven about it, you know, because I was like, yeah. Max, I don't think it's playing well. Like I can't tell, and he's like, No, you're killing. Just mentalism has a different set of reactions. Yeah. And when we go like when the when the thing vanishes, the audience, oh, impossible. But they know the thing didn't vanish. You know, they yeah. know, oh, my God, it's floating. How? But they know it's not floating. But if you tell someone their dog's name, well, now that's, you know, NSA stuff like you're like, you know, too much, you know, like, <laughs> right. and it, it breaches. It's a whole different area of in audiences minds. Mentalism is possible. Right. Sure. I mean, there's a great, there's a large percentage of the population that thinks it's real. Yeah. So, yeah. but magic, I mean, ah. <laughs> I could be, I could be convinced. I think it's those kinds of moments. I mean, I was doing a thing with a predicted baby name in this letter from my dead uncle, which had a lot of gags in it, you know, but that kind of a moment in the set that I was doing, they are so not expecting it that it, it's almost, I, I don't want to say it was like too staggering, but when they're not expecting it, they do need, they need more time than if they were to go see Max Maven where they know, Oh my God, this guy's a mind reader. And it's set up in that. That's the the bubble that we're in is that the guy on stage, you know, knows the pin number on my credit card and knows this and knows this and, and whatever. But in a show where I give a woman my phone number and do this stupid gag and oh, I have a hangover and it's a coat hanger with the word hang on it or whatever dumb gags. It's like they're not expecting you to know something so precise that it, it they do genuinely need more silence maybe than even in a normal mentalism show to kind of slow it down and, and give them that time. So it's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's out. true. Being, being comedy magician too, that those moments of astonishment do kind of jump out like a jack in the box. Like, whoa, you know, uh, like... I didn't know this was going to be good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I 100% get that seven minutes into the show almost every time. And now I've learned, oh, we need to kind of <laughs> bring it back in. Sorry. What is it that happens seven minutes in? I do uh, a gag that ends in no trick. Then I do four minutes of just jokes about me. Then I do a couple minutes of jokes with the woman setting up a trick that they absolutely do not think is going to be a trick. It's the the ball oh, under yeah. the cloth trick. Yes. Uh, where most people think that that's going to end in a bad gag, and it kind of does, but it also that is a gen. That's the first genuine trick in the show where people go, "Holy, you know, wow, a lady said a thing, and he was right." Like, <laughs> which I guess that's a long time for some magic shows, but also, you know, I want that time early on to set up me and set up the feel of the room if that makes any sense i want i want them to understand the fawns so that we can put him in the woods <laughs> hey yep yep but, derek do you have a similar progression of getting to amazement what i do is i want to come out because the audience has a preconceived notion of what a magician is and if they're not a fan of mine they don't know they don't know what they're in for but they know magician in their mind so I found the cheesiest magician music I could find this, da -da 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 -da, you know, and D D Derek Hughes. And I walk out and I'm serious like Lance Burton and I have ropes in my hand and I come to the mic and I'm like, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Derek Hughes. I'm a master magician. And right now it's time for magic. And I make a pose and I'm looking at the ropes and then I go to the sound booth. I'm like, uh, can we cut the music? Actually, this isn't magic. This is a, this is a trick music and then it goes back into the music and now right away we go ah he comes out this is the magician i expect and then within the first minute oh this is not gonna go the way i thought it might go and then it's a stop and start with the music leading up to a moment that shows a pretty good trick so they know okay we're in good hands and i you know cut the music and then we're off and running and they know it's a magic show the magic's going to be at least pretty good and this isn't the magician that I hate. Okay. So it sounds like it's setting expectations and also evolving those expectations throughout the routine, the show. It's, yeah, it's breaking them. Yep. Okay. And, it, and yes, evolving them. 
Absolutely. And I think there's something, I mean, if there is something in my persona over time that's, that's developed, it's, I do, I do rec looking, observing, dissecting my material, my set. I do see that I play with the idea of a flaw and the idea of a mistake, you know, and the, the heightened version of it would be, you know, any, any standard sucker trick that you could buy at Eagle Magic. But I do play with, oh, magician in peril or the magician messed up and then something impossible happens. And I like this idea because uh, the magician is, you know, often sort of this all powerful, you know, omnipotent controlled being, but I'm not, but the magic still happens. So I, I will take credit for that. But the idea is maybe magic and I don't hit this hard enough, you know, but I, and I could explore it further. The idea that magic is everywhere and exists, and we just have to sort of be open to recognizing it and letting it happen. But as the magician, I'll take credit. Yeah, like we said uh, before the interview, Derek is so good, you forget how good he is. Yeah. If that's, if that's a weird way of putting it. He's just such a consummate professional on stage and off. You know, if you liked that interview, and I think you did, didn't you, Jim? I really did. In fact, I, I, as I, uh, while I went through the interview and then re-listened to it, I thought to myself, we got to get word to the local people that they talked about, Bill Arnold, Fred Vaish, uh, Jerry Johnson. We got to let them know that these two guys, uh, you know, because who knows if, if those guys are aware of the influence that they had on two really powerful professional magicians. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think Jerry and Fred and, and especially Bill Arnold, who uh, we all know and love here in the Twin Cities, would, would be tickled pink to hear that interview. So we got to make sure and figure out a way to either tag them here or call them directly and say, you got to listen because these guys, uh, these guys are talking about you. Yeah, deservedly so. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of talking, they, they talked more than what we've got right here. We tried to end the interview and they came back and wouldn't leave. We have a whole nother 15 minutes of them chatting that you can uh, both see and hear on our YouTube channel on Behind the Page, Eli Marks YouTube channel. It's about 15 minutes of uh, them refusing to leave, which was uh, fun. And then getting into some some stuff we just didn't have time for in this episode. Yeah, uh, check that out on our YouTube channel. I know I will because... I love to go to our YouTube channel. Have you ever been to the YouTube channel? I don't think it exists. It, 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 it might. It does. I have, not, I have no independent corroboration. I, I don't know. Let me ask you this. Do you get our podcast? Do you get podcasts? Are you I, one of those? Yes, I, there, are, there are podcast co-hosts who have never heard the podcast they're in. Uh, I have listened to <laughs> several. several okay. to, uh, I've listened to an episode or two. Yes, okay. I, I, I do. Um, I, I'm coming into a period of my year here where I'm going to spend a lot of time in the car alone, uh, both going and coming to uh, a gig that's about 45 minutes from the house. So that'll be my that'll be my plan, as far as you know. In terms, sorry of, to put you on the spot there. No, 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 that's fine. That's just fine. No, I will say this: I listened to almost all of the interviews. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're at almost all the interviews too. Yeah. So, uh, but, but you got to, I have to re-listen to them because sometimes between the time we actually interview people yep. and the time that we release that episode, some time has gone by. And I know okay. the general sort of, I remember the general kind of conversation, but uh, it's important for me to listen to what you actually put in those episodes. Cause we talk for a long time and then it gets edited. To it does. What it it does. Because they're trying to keep it to an hour. And in order to keep it to an hour, let's just jump into our reading this week. Uh, last week, we uh, listened to chapter 14, uh, which was Eli following Boone all around the city and then getting conked on the head. I believe where we left it was he, uh, I think everything at that point just went to black. <laughs> The Ambitious Card, an Eli Marks Mystery. Chapter 15. The blackness was like a deep hole, easy to fall into, but much, much harder to pull myself out of. However, that didn't stop me from trying. Each attempt seemed to bring me closer to something resembling the real world, and then the fingers of my consciousness would lose their grip 
and I'd slide back down into the warm and comforting blackness. The state I was in was just this side of dreaming, but my battered brain made no attempt to construct a story out of the random images that flickered by. If this was my life flashing before my eyes, it was doing so in a very disorganized manner. Someone seemed to have left out all the good parts. I resigned myself to this feeling and floated in a field of nothingness for what seemed like a long time. And then like a movie projector popping on after a power blackout, I suddenly opened my eyes and found myself staring at ceiling tiles that were whiter than white. I turned to my left and was blinded by the sun coming through an unfamiliar window. I squinted involuntarily and turned to my right, where I was surprised to see Deirdre seated in a chair, casually flipping through a magazine. Her blonde hair was nearly blinding in the bright light that flooded the room. She looked up at the sound of me rolling over. Hey, you're back, she said cheerfully, setting the magazine aside. The intensity of my squinting must have registered with her because she immediately walked to the window and adjusted the blinds. This mercifully brought the light level down to a more manageable, cave-like environment. I was just sitting here doing my impression of the last line of your favorite book, she said, as she returned to her chair. To kill a mockingbird, I said, puzzled by the reference. Good. Your brain is at least working a little bit. And what's the last line? I thought about it for a moment. He would be there all night, and he would be there when Jem waked up in the morning. Bingo. So, I asked, my mouth dry and my voice raspy. It's the next morning? Yes, it's about, she glanced at her watch, about 12 hours since you walked into Ariana Dupree's apartment and got clonked on the head. Who hit me? We're still trying to work that out. I glanced past her around the room, recognizing that I was in some sort of medical setting. I was clearly in a hospital bed, that much was certain. I was wearing a hospital gown that, now that I was on my side, was affording a comforting breeze up my backside. There was an IV in my wrist and a heart rate monitor clipped on my index finger, and my head hurt like hell. The door to the room opened to crack, and I could see the unmistakable blue uniform of a cop seated right outside the door. I looked back at Deirdre. The cop guarding the door. Is he here to prevent me from leaving the room or prevent someone else from coming in? A little of both. We looked at each other for a long moment. There was a lot more going on behind her eyes than she was telling me. Ariana, I asked tentatively. Deirdre shook her head. Dead, she said. How? She jumped or was pushed off her balcony. Twenty-three stories. I lay back on my pillow which felt as hard as my head. I stared at the ceiling for several seconds, then looked back toward Deirdre. Was there a playing card? I asked, not really wanting to hear an answer. The King of Diamonds, she said. They found it in her pocket. It was pretty messed up, as you can imagine, but they found it. So Ariana, the full-body healer, she cut me off, finishing my sentence for me, broke every bone in her body. Yeah, we put that one together right after we found the playing card. Someone has a very sick sense of humor. And I suppose homicide detective Fred Hutton is still convinced that someone is me, I said, my voice cracking from the dryness in my throat. Well, let me put it this way. You may have been unconscious, but you've had a busy night, she said, getting up and handing me a cup of water from the tray near the bed. It must have been sitting there a while for it was the epitome of room temperature. I didn't care. I took a long sip that began the process of lubricating my Sahara-like throat. As the night has gone on, she continued, you've progressed from the possibility of being charged with first-degree murder and assault down to accessory to a first-degree murder, down to attempted murder, down to perhaps just assault, if you're lucky. They're still mixing and matching your options, even as we speak. No wonder I'm exhausted, I said. I handed the empty cup back to her. She refilled it from the styrofoam pitcher, and I was glad to hear the sound of ice cubes dropping into the cup along with the water. 
She gave the cup back to me, and I held it against my forehead for several seconds, enjoying the cold, numbing feeling it produced. So, why do the charges keep changing, I asked, before taking another long sip. As more facts come in, they adjust the charges to fit the facts, she said. For example, originally they thought that you and this fellow Boone were in on it together, and that after you both pitched Miss Dupree off the balcony, you got into a fight and knocked each other out. Interesting, I said. What particular fly soiled that ointment? They looked at the security tapes. Turns out you got in the elevator at just about the very moment that Miss Dupree went off the balcony. The tapes are time-stamped. If you'd been outside a few seconds earlier, you might have actually seen the fall. I'm glad I missed that. So what theory popped up after they looked at the security tapes? They considered accessory to first-degree murder, but Boone is insisting he's only met you once before. He seems adamant about it, although he refuses to tell us why he was at Miss Dupree's apartment. The last I heard, they're leaning toward sticking the murder charge on Boone and sticking you with some sort of attempted murder charge or accessory after the fact, or at the very least, assault on the person of Mr. Boone. How do you feel about that plan of action? She sat back in her chair and gave me her most serious look. I'm withholding judgment until you tell me what you were doing in that building and that apartment in particular last night. I was following Boone. Why? I'm not entirely certain. Where's Boone now? They gave him ten stitches, bandaged his head, and took him in for questioning. He spent the night in jail. Apparently, his head is much harder than yours. She leaned toward me. So why were you following Boone? It's a long story. I've got all day, and you're not going anywhere until the doctor signs you out. And in order to sign you out, he has to get by the cop at the door. So let me ask you again. Why were you following Boone? My head was pounding, and this conversation wasn't helping. However, it was clear that I had few options before me, perhaps even none. I gave her an abbreviated version of my conversation with Ariana at Akashic Records. Then I told her about my meeting with Franny, leaving out only those key details that might, if misconstrued, tie me even closer to the current roster of murders. Details like Franny seeing my image connected to the killings. So you followed him around town all day and into the night on the advice of a psychic it sounds less reasonable when you say it. All I can say is that it felt right at the time. She leaned back in her chair and stared at a point on the wall for what felt like a long time. Then she turned back to me. Eli, tell me honestly, do you have any idea why you're mixed up in all this? Deirdre, I honestly don't know. I can't figure it out. She looked at me for a moment, then reached for her purse and pulled out her ubiquitous tube of lipstick. Well, let's see what we can do about getting you out of here, she said, as she began to apply a new coat to her lips. Before I could go, I had to wait to be officially discharged. While I waited, a nurse insisted that I eat my breakfast, which had been sitting on the tray by my bed for what tasted like a long time. It was just about as delectable as you might imagine. Finally, I received a visit from the attending physician, a good-natured transplanted New Yorker with thinning red hair and a bushy red beard. Back from the dead, are we? He said with a laugh as he entered the room and started to page through my chart. So far, I said. Stick around here long enough, we can take care of that. He finished with the chart in record time, even for a speed reader set it back in its holder, and turned his attention toward me. I'm Dr. Levine. I was on call last night when they brought you in. You had quite the smack on the head, he said as he ran a hand over my skull, stopping when I winced. You'll have a bump for a few days, but not to worry. We did an x-ray of your head last night and found nothing. Rim shot, I said, tapping out a quick drum roll with my fingers on the bedside tray. 
Thank you, thank you. I'm here all week. Try the veal. To be on the safe side, I'd recommend staying away from the veal in our cafeteria unless you truly want to be here all week. He peered into my left eye, shining a small pen light at my pupil. Seriously, it's uncommon for someone to be unconscious for as long as you were after a hit on the head. That's why you spent the night in the hospital while your friend got stitched up and went home. Actually, went to jail. Well, yes, there is that. He peered into my right eye. However, what they do to you once you leave here is outside of my sphere of influence. And my friend, by the looks of things, you're ready to leave my sphere right about now. He put the pen light into one pocket of his white lab jacket and pulled the prescription pad out of the other. He scribbled quickly on the pad and tore the top sheet off, handing it to me. Here's your discharge notes, he said. Follow these instructions and you should be fine. Take care of yourself. He gave me a friendly pat on the shoulder and with that, he was gone. I could hear him as he entered the room across the hall. What? I heard him say in mock surprise. Don't tell me you made it through the night. Well, I just lost five bucks. His voice receded as the door swung shut. Deirdre got up and opened the closet, pulling my pants and shirt off the built-in hangers. I looked at the prescription in my hand. Although he had the typically poor penmanship universally attributed to all physicians, I was able to make out what he wrote with no trouble. It read simply, Don't get hit on the head anymore. It would have been nice to go home and crawl into my own bed, but that was not to be. Instead, I was transported in handcuffs, no less, from the hospital to the downtown police station, the same squad room homicide detective Fred Hutton and his partner had brought me into after Gray's death. The transporting officers didn't take my personal effects this time, just sat me on a bench and told me to stay put. There was a general bustle in the room, a buzz of activity, and I was surprised that no one paid the least bit of attention to me. From where I sat, I could see the enclosed interrogation room they had put me in during my last visit. The door to the room was open, and through it I could see Boone, looking even worse than he had the day before, slumped in a chair. Homicide detective Fred Hutton was pacing behind Boone. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but whatever it was, it wasn't getting any response from Boone, who had a sullen, glassy look plastered on his face. Deirdre, who had driven herself from the hospital, arrived at that moment. She sized up the mood in the room quickly, immediately establishing my position and its relation to her current husband, like a dog owner who's always on edge trying to prevent two disagreeable mutts from biting each other's balls off. Assured that we were a safe distance apart, she crossed the large squad room. Homicide detective Fred Hutton saw her coming and made a beeline toward her. He grabbed her elbow and steered her away from the interrogation room, in the process putting them within eavesdropping distance from me. I looked away and did my best to give the impression that I couldn't hear them. Get anything out of Boone? Deirdre asked. Homicide detective Fred Hutton shook his head. He still insists he walked into the apartment and got clonked on the head, refuses to say why he was there. She glanced in my direction. I was looking at my shoes. How about the security tapes? They've got cameras on all the entrance doors and all the elevators and all the stairwells. Our guys sat with the building's security guards and went through the tapes. No one who came in that doesn't belong, with the exception of Boone and your ex. We've got men watching the monitors now. What about motive for Boone? And for that matter, Eli, she added as an afterthought. Looks like Boone just broke up with that girl Nova something. She was previously involved with Gray and with Miss Dupree. Apparently she swings both ways. Deirdre merely grunted and he continued. Might be some sort of revenge crime of passion thing. I sent a car to pick her up. Where's Eli fit in all this? I snuck a look at him. Homicide detective Fred Hutton was chewing on his lower lip. Deirdre stared up at him, and after several seconds, he looked away. Poor bastard. 
I'll admit that besides proximity, we don't have much to go on. Let's face it, Fred, you don't have anything to go on with him. He's met the other suspect once, has virtually no connection to the three victims. All you've got is a playing card that keeps turning up the crime scenes, and that's not going to hold up in court. So you just want to let him go? Again? I think that would be the wisest course of action at this point. Okay, and then what happens if someone else dies and we prove Eli did it and the press finds out we brought him in twice and let him go twice on the advice of the district attorney's office? Then I'm going to be updating my resume and we'll probably end up going back to the ice capades. But until that time, the district attorney's office doesn't feel that there is sufficient evidence for a conviction in this case. That's your final answer? That's my final answer. I tried to contain a laugh, but I couldn't, and it burst out an explosive snort that was louder than the laugh would have been if I hadn't tried to suppress it. They both turned in unison and stared at me. Sorry, I said. For a moment, it sounded like I was flipping channels and it stumbled on who wants to be a millionaire. Homicide detective Fred Hutton ignored my observation. Marks, you're free to go. Again. I'll get someone to uncuff you. Deirdre walked me out of the office and down the long corridor to the elevator without saying a word. I pressed the button and we waited in silence for the elevator to arrive. I hope I'm not getting you into any trouble with all of this, I said. I mean, I appreciate what you're doing on my behalf. Damn straight, she said, giving the button a couple of violent but wholly unnecessary jabs with her index finger. Now, do me a favor and put as much distance as you can between yourself and the other people currently involved in this investigation. I will absolutely do that, no problem, I said as the bell signaling the elevator dinged and the doors began to part. Before they were completely opened, I was greeted with a sound that fell somewhere between a yelp of joy and a screech of surprise. Eli, the voice yelled, and I looked over in time to see Nova bounding out of the elevator and throwing her arms around me. She was dressed in tight blue jeans and a colorful shirt, that seemed to be an artful blend of peasant blouse and halter top, which left the healthy serving of her tanned midsection uncovered. Thank God you're here. Ariana's dead, and they've brought Boone in, and everything is just colossally fucked up. Behind Nova were two uniformed cops, and from the puzzled expressions on their faces, I guessed that they had been the ones assigned to pick her up and bring her in for questioning. I imagined that it had been a very interesting car ride, one that they would be recounting to their co-workers for years to come. Let me guess. You're Nova, Deirdre said as she stepped forward and took charge. I'm Deirdre Sutton Hutton, Assistant District Attorney. Thanks for coming down today. We just need a few minutes of your time to ask you some questions about the unfortunate events of the last couple days. These two officers will take you to our conference room and get you settled. I'll be in with a representative of the Homicide Department in just a moment. I'm not sure if Nova understood or even heard much of what Deirdre said, but as I discovered many times in the past, Deirdre's tone and manner were so self-assured that people generally slipped into a docile mode around her and instinctively did what she said. Such was the case with Nova who unhooked her arms from my neck, smiled meekly, and followed the two cops down the hall. Before she had gotten too far, she turned back to me. And Eli, thanks again for staying with me the other night. It was great. Nova then averted her eyes from Deirdre and continued down the hall with the cops. Deirdre turned slowly and gave me a look that was hard to read. It's not what you think. I began, trying to come up with something plausible on the fly. What I think is that she probably came on to you in a big way and chased magic man that you are. You spent the night sleeping two feet from her bed, sitting in a chair, fully clothed. Oh, I said, taken aback by her prescience. Then I guess it is what you think. 
Go home, Eli. I stepped into the elevator and turned to give her a friendly way, but she was already headed back down the hall. And now we're back. So uh, as I mentioned in the last episode, Eli gets hit on the head a lot. And Dr. Levine, uh, uh, I don't remember his real name, but he's an actual doctor that I uh, was my GP for a short amount of time. He'd been an ER doctor, became just a regular GP and got bored by it, went back to the ER. But he was a acerbic and funny doctor, and he ended up here in the in the book. I like that. that uh, that's good. And I just, I want to revisit the, the, the Jim doesn't listen to the podcast. I'd like to think... <laughs> Boy, I, I just got to say, we talked about it. You went away. You read an entire chapter of a book out loud. Yes. And now you're back to Jim. In my mind, though, while I was reading, I was okay. thinking, I have always been a C plus student. I've done just exactly what I needed to do to get by. I'm not your A student who's. You you're know, not asking for student. extra credit. No, I'm just trying to pass the podcast. That's all. So I've done what I need to do in order to achieve a C plus, which gets me well my scholarship. I think it keeps my scholarship in place. I don't know if it's going to help you because the podcast is totally pass fail. We don't do grades. Well, well then I'm fine. You're, I'm going to pass. Oh, you're absolutely going to pass just because you've shown up for every, just showing up is 90% of the battle and you've done it for 16 episodes. Decisions are made by those who show up. Yes, and here you are. Be that as it may, uh, we have some great guests coming up. We've got the, the lovely and charming Mike Caveney, uh, who will be with us next time, to talk about uh, one of the most... Uh, iconic, maybe. Yeah, one of the most iconic, you're right, one of the most iconic tricks uh, in all of magic history, which is sawing a woman in half. Or um, how did he put it now? There's, there's, it's actually two different tricks. One of them is sawing through a woman. And that's trick one. And the other one is uh, sawing a woman in half, which is actually an entirely different trick. I didn't know that. We're going to find out more about that uh, at our next episode. Following that, we have uh, a great interview with uh, Carissa Hendricks, otherwise known as Lucy Darling. If you think back to uh, some of the stuff we talked about today with uh, Nick and Derek about comedy and magic. Carissa combines them very nicely and also has some really interesting theories about how tightly related the two are, about how you're leading the audience by the hand and they don't know if it's going to be a comedy payoff or a magic payoff and the way she uses that in her act to, to keep them uh, to off balance. And then the episode after that is a fantastic interview with uh, David Kay, otherwise known as Silly Billy, who uh, knows so much about children's magic and how to deal with children, which is something that at that point of the book, Eli is going to be dealing with. Uh, it's not something he does very often, uh, but David Kay does it all the time and has some great tips for, for Eli if he ever has to ever has to deal with kids again. Yeah. Anyway, lots and lots and lots of great people coming up. If you want to help us get this podcast to more people, I just would ask you to subscribe and rate us. They tell me, uh, and you and I both know as little about podcasting as is possible and still run a podcast. But anyway, they tell me getting reviews or just getting rated on Apple Podcasts has the highest impact. Uh, so if you like what you're doing or uh, if you just like us, go to Apple Podcasts and rate us. You don't have to write anything. You just click five stars or four stars. If it's going to be anything under four stars, you know, stay home. But if you want to go do that, I've got a link for that in the show notes. It'll take you right to right to us on Apple Podcasts. That'd be a huge help. Really would. We'd, we'd, we'd appreciate that. As a C-plus student, I'm counting on you. So anyway, we will be back in a couple of weeks with Mike Caveney and the next chapter of The Ambitious Card. Until then, thank you so much for tuning in. Take care, everybody. God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs> This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.